here's my presentation. I think it was quite a, quite an amazing week. A lot of interesting stuff presented out there, and uh, me personally, I got the opportunity to um, you know learn a lot. But at the same time, I hope that uh, today, this evening, that my presentation will get to maybe learn something new, something interesting, something based from my experience. Essentially, I'll be, I'll be presenting something that I was working on over the past year and I'm improving over the last month. Your feedback is more than welcome, and generally, I'm really curious how um, it will be received by the uh, broader Latvian community. Uh, a couple of words about myself. So, um, my name is Dennis. I think that's enough for now. Um, I was introduced to the NI universe around six years ago. So, I started to work in 2014 for National Instruments, and I started to work as an applications engineer. Then, after some time, some time um, I joined an uh, integrated company, so ProDSP Technologies. It's based in Budapest, and I was being that, I was, I was with them, I was working with them for, for quite some time. And recently, uh, for several months now, so I joined back in I, and now I'm working as part of the uh, NI R&D team, and we are working currently on developing the um, very sound ecosystem. So basically working with very sound custom devices and um, generally developing products. So that's in short about me. If you're curious, if you have questions and things like this, we can discuss afterwards. We can take it offline. Um, yeah, because actually what I want to present to you today is not me essentially, but rather the thing that I was working on. And I think I think would be could be could be quite quite interesting. And to actually to get it started, I'll have to probably um, start with some background story. So how this whole thing started. Um, some time ago, so uh, when I joined the ProDSP technology, so when I joined the integrated company, um, I was actually introduced to the actor framework universe, if you will. Um, basically, ProDSP technology is what it does. They're basically an integrated company, so they are um, building automated test systems. So that's what I do. And at the time when they joined, they were already working on some projects, and those projects were relying heavily on the active framework. Now, so I tried, uh, I did jump basically right, right, right into them. And this is where actually I, um, my, my, my relationship with the active framework started for the time. It was more of a, let's say, love hate relationship, if you will, as maybe many of you know. Uh, but I like to believe that it was pretty good. I learned a lot, and I learned to appreciate all of the uh, advantages that it offers, as well as the shortcomings that I had to actually fight with, and then um, led to the development of the of the framework. Uh, as usual, you know, when when I started to work uh, on my first project, the first thing that I saw were the problems, because well, that's that's what I saw, and while attempting to solve the problem via the core framework, this is when actually I got to learn a bit better the actual framework and actually learn to leverage the intrinsic advantages that it offers and then put into good use. A couple of words about the, uh, let's say, uh, actual framework itself. So what does it do? Um, well, essentially, it's something that has been around lobby for quite some time, so basically since 2012. Uh, many people love it, many people hate it, but what it can do is actually the fact that it can allow you to relatively easily build a complex application with um, multi-process, so complex multi-process applications. Uh, essentially, in actor, what it is, is a um, good message handler who wraps in an object. So that's what it does. And then the API itself allows you to actually manage this object and then provides an interesting messaging interface that allows you to communicate between objects. So that's, that's what I do. Especially here on this diagram, so a uh, very short presentation. So basically, you have a bunch of parallel processes in parallel, and they're exchanging messages between themselves. That's, that's what they do. Um, them being OP, obviously, they have inheritance, and um, they have encapsulation, and well, pretty much you know anything that the larger objects offer. Uh, but you know, besides um, Besides the advantage that it offers, obviously it has problems as well, and that's, that's what I had. So I kind of started to love the echo framework for the, um, you know, for these specific advantages that it offers, and then I started to hate it a little bit, or what made me think about this is um, the problems that it created at the time. So 
what are the challenges normally when we deal with the with the actual framework? Well, one of them, or one of the most important ones, rather, is the uh, fact that when you have a bunch of uh, processes running in parallel in the application, there is always the risk that one of them will just you know you lose control over that. So, especially in the sorry in the development phase when you're developing actors, you have say multiple actors running this part of the system, then what can happen? Well, you can either lose control of it, and unfortunately, the actual framework as it is does not provide tools, efficient tools for debugging that. So as it happens, you end up with an application that somehow, I don't know, it's unresponsive, or you're trying to shut it down, wouldn't. And since uh, you don't have debugging tools, then you have to actually really try to figure out really deeply what's happening with that. So, Pretty much, that's actually why a lot of people, I think, don't like the framework so much. Another thing or another challenge that you will um, see typically when working the actor framework is the uh, starting linkage between between the actors. And again, I'm talking about vanilla actor framework. I know that there are variations over there, and I know that there are different messaging types. But I'm talking really about the basic actor framework and how how it's designed. So if you imagine an actor framework as uh, basically being something like this. It's a library, and inside the library you have a class which represents your actor, and then you have their data and you have methods. Then inside the same class you have messages that you can use to throw to transfer data, you know, or sorry, so messages that you can use to communicate with other actors. Now, normally when you work with the actor framework, or generally when you build an application like this and you want to communicate between two actors, assuming that these are my two actors here, Assuming that this is a method of one of the actors, if I want from actor one to write to the other, first my original actor, then basically I'll need to essentially take one of these messages and basically put it here. So that essentially uh, launches or that essentially initiates the communication between the two actors. By doing so, however, well, another thing that I'm doing is essentially I'm creating a static linkage between two libraries. So by using one of the messages from one of the libraries into the other, then basically I'm creating a static dependency between the between the two of them. And well, that's kind of problematic. So it's okay if you have only like I don't know, one, two actors, but you have a bunch of them and they're all communicating with each other, they're exchanging messages, and basically you end up linking all of those libraries between themselves. Well, the problem that it creates is that um, it makes the code reviews extremely difficult and um, essentially makes uh, yeah yeah the, make make it makes it more difficult, for example, to actually take one of the libraries that you developed for this project and use it somewhere else. Uh, to do so, you need to actually modify and remove dependencies, and well, that's kind of cumbersome and that's kind of problematic. Actually, one of the projects that I faced while working on the uh, at probably SP at the time, was that uh, basically, again, we had a PC application, we developed a bunch of actors that were doing a lot of stuff, and uh, what we wanted at some point is to take some of the actors and use them on the real-time target. Uh, well, that was actually kind of difficult, so we had actually to do a lot of refactoring because we needed to actually trim and remove all the dependencies that you know, we had within, within our system. Okay, so that would be another challenge that we faced at the time. Now, the third challenge that I'm going to refer to right now is specifically data sharing between actors. Assuming that you have an application or a typical application and assume that you have two actors in this case. And in this particular case, assume that one of the actors act, uh, would act as your uh, data acquisition engine, so something that acquires some data, for instance, right? And then you have the other actor that acts as a user interface. And what you would do at the time, you would actually, you would want to uh, input some configuration in your user interface and then pass that configuration into the um, data acquisition actor and then here some stuff would happen, right? Now, um, typically how it's done or typically how this problem is solved uh, across, you know, development teams is that you define a private data cluster which would contain uh, the properties of the, of the configuration that you need. So, for example, you define this in the user interface actor, so some here, and then you make this as a uh, type definition, and then you import it in the second actor. So, for example, some of here, and then basically whenever you update, and then I don't know, you create a message for it, and so on and so forth. And if you later on want to, let's say, maintain this type definition, so you want to add, remove properties, and things like this, and since it's a type definition, then you don't have to worry about um, changes propagating from one point to another. 
However, what this solution does, it essentially creates, again, a dependency between the two actors. So if I create a type definition in the first actor, and then I'm using it in the second, then, well, again, I have a data dependency between the two of them. Another solution that you could go for at this stage is actually define two different clusters, but with the same structure. So one cluster, so one type definition in my first actor, then another type definition of the identical structure in the second, um, in the second actor. Then basically, again, you can use, since you have identical data structures, you can pass using the data from one actor to the other. But obviously the disadvantage here is that you would end up with um, basically uh, repeating code. So that's one of them. And second of all, it becomes extremely hard to maintain. So basically if you modify something here, then you have to modify something here as well and so on and so forth. And this obviously does not scale too well, so this, that, that's not a solution. And again, um, when talking about small applications where you have a limited number of actors, then these are not such big problems But when we're talking about large applications and we want to deal with this, well, then this actually becomes um, quite, quite problematic. So these were the first, let's say, three challenges that I faced when um, basically working with the actor framework. And this essentially led to me starting developing a framework, so the core framework on top of them initially to mitigate these particular challenges, but later on, uh, actually, it turned out to be something more because it added up to developing and actually providing a lot of uh, interesting tools for the development teams. So that's how it started, basically. And uh, to tackle this problem, which so I started with this part. So first of all, the uh, messaging, then the debugging techniques and the debugging and troubleshooting of the actors, and then data sharing between the uh, between the actors. So this is what actually created or started the, the core framework. So what it is the core framework, or what, uh, what I want it to be? Um, well, first of all, um, unlike many of the frameworks that exist currently out there, um, it's a service-based actor uh, framework. So what it does is actually it provides uh, a set of classes, and at each of these classes, at the level of each of these classes, I'm attempting to solve specific problems, which I'll describe, I'll describe further. And also, besides the classes themselves, uh, the actor comes with a series of pre-built services that run in the background and essentially help you uh, mitigate or help you to actually, um, I don't know, manage a bit better or manage better the uh, processes running in your, in your application, in your system, as well as actually providing you with uh, very useful APIs and functionality across across your application. So it's actually it's, it's a full fledged framework. Um, I started initially, obviously, from the base class. So this is my uh, so the base, actual base class. I build on top of it the C module class, and then the C panel class, and the C web class. And I don't know if we have time, and depending how how, they, how 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 our presentation goes, then I'll try to actually walk you through the main. Um, ideas actually which are the main concepts that are included in this in this classes. So to tackle the uh, original actual thing problems, uh, I created the C module class. And in the C module class I defined, I started by defined first of all uh, a message interface. Now why was it required? Well the first one of the problems that I described here was the dependencies or the or the message dependencies that were created between between the between the libraries. And what I wanted to have is actually end up with a bunch of actors which are zero coupled between each other, even when messaging between them. And obviously to use obviously to, to, to obtain such an effect, I needed to get to um, I needed to use I needed to create sort of some sort of an interface between them. Now I'm not talking about the Lottie 2020 interface which was launched right now. I'm talking about something that I had to build for myself and would act as an interface. So uh, I started to work on this framework uh, around one year, one year ago, and at the time still there were only rumors about the interfaces being available in the next edition of LabVIEW. So at the time I didn't have the interface tools at my, uh, at my disposal, so I actually had to uh, develop my own approach to solving this problem. So, what I did actually was to try and define an interface for, for an actor. So essentially, first of all, provide a separate class, so the C module, and for that particular class, provide an interface that will actually decouple the uh, actor from the messaging happening between, between them. How does it work in this case? Well, I started by defining an abstract message, in this case, the general, a 
general message of the how it's called in the um, uh, in, in 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 the framework. So this particular message has a bunch of um, interesting properties. So this general message has the property that it would it could have been received by any C module in the framework. Okay, and then this particular message basically would target methods defined in the public, public interface of that particular module. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, essentially, I define this module as having sort of a, let's say, interface, right? So it's a typical actor, and an actor I'll have a bunch of methods in there. And I would have private methods, basically, that are used to, I don't know, are implemented to do specific stuff. And then I'll have the public methods, basically methods that I want to expose, that I want to be callable from the, um, from, from the rest of my application. So, I have the general method, uh, the general message, and using it, I can target basically only the public methods, the exposed methods within my actor, without actually uh, accessing the private methods defined in my in my class. So how does this work? This message it's not the typical actor message. It's essentially more of a descriptor of the action that I want the actor to perform. So a message, a general message in this case, uh, would have three properties. So it will have the, I mean, it will have the name of the module that I want to target. Uh, I will have the message name, or actually the action that I want to invoke on the target module, and then the payload, which can be obviously anything. So in this case, it's simple variant, and that's how it goes. So I'm sending a general message to my target actor. Uh, it has the name of the method that I want to, I want to invoke. And then I have the payload, which can be anything. So this is essentially a zero coupled message. It creates no dependency between the uh, between the classes. Then in my target method, sorry, in my target actor, in my target C module, I will take this message. I check basically if the target method is actually declared as part of the interface. If it was declared, then I will actually invoke that method and I'll do whatever it is that it has to be. Yeah, it has to be uh, defined, or if not, it will be actually uh, it will be ignored. Okay, so getting back to the original slide, basically I have the same um, I have the same class I, I have the same class structure as you would know with the typical actor, right? But then I differentiate between the private methods and the public methods, which create the public interface. And the difference between the private and the public interface, is, or the public methods in this case, is that these are callable. So I can actually target them with a general message. Now, how does the interface itself look like? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. Um, I'll have, for example, uh, a bunch of, uh, of methods in my class. I would create uh, messages or uh, public messages for those particular methods. And then they become basically they, uh, they are being included in, in, in an array of messages which actually represent my, my interface. So when uh, a general message comes in, basically it would go through the public interface. I check if, for example, the uh, target method was declared. If so, executing it. If not, then basically I'm, I'm skipping it. The message in itself it looks. Pretty simple, actually. So I have the name of the module that I want to target by using strings in this case. I would have the name of the message that I want to invoke, and then the payload, which can be pretty much anything in this particular case. Um, how the interface itself is implemented? Well, this is done basically in um, there is some code actually, which is abstracted to the developer, but essentially I'm invoking the do of the general message in the general message then. This is where I'm processing the name, I'm checking the payload, I'm calling the special, and basically if the method exists or it was declared, then I'm calling the corresponding um, specialized uh, method or public method in this particular case. Okay, so essentially this allows me to create um, a communication mechanism which was um, dependency free. So I could communicate with any module um, using the public interface, I could use a will and Actually, that works, that works pretty well. I'm going to show you a bit later some demos, and I hope you'll understand a bit better actually what I did to this part. For the um, second challenge, for the third challenge, let's say with um, developing or actually passing configuration data from uh, one actor to another. For this particular case, I actually decided to go for 
um, a more, let's say, let's say more unusual solution, if you will. So I moved away from using uh, private data in this case. So I moved away from using. Uh, so here, I moved away from uh, using, let's say, private class or pri uh, internal internal data classes, public data. I moved from using static, let's say, data structures. Uh, towards using actually uh, dynamic data structures, if you if you will. So instead of actually having a um, a structure that I'm defining as part of the private data cluster of the actor, then actually I have a data structure which is descriptive in nature. It's something that is being creating being created at runtime, and it, it exists um, it exists as part of the where it's actually creating it's creating a runtime. And then later on, it gets as part of the module. It can be modified, it's uh, editable, and it actually it actually gives you the kind of flexibility that allows you to um, create um, create properties, create keys on the fly. Okay, so how does it look? Where actually, where how does it work? Essentially, let me show you here a couple of examples. Actually, I think that would be better. So I'm going to share with you my screen. Okay, so I hope you see it right now. So um, in this case, this is the uh, an example of the of an application built of this framework. And here you have the C module class, interface messages, the uh, methods themselves. And uh, for this particular case, so I'm gonna show you an uh, example of a module built with this dynamic data structure. So if I'm gonna go into the in this case, I'm gonna go to the the some generator. I'm going to go into the module override, the initialize module keys. So what's happening actually here is that I'll have a set of um, I think I'll show you like this a bit better. So if I'm to show you, for example, this sector, you see that there is no private data in here. So I'm not using that. Uh, in this case, what I do, I create actually a bunch of Keys and I create a bunch of, uh, sorry, a tree data structure that is being actually initialized at runtime. Uh, the way it works, when the application is being launched, this method, this method is being called and the specific, um, the specific structure is being, is being created. Um, sorry, a second. Okay. I mentioned that I have the three data structures. So what does it mean? It means that actually I can create, um, data which is structured hierarchically. So I have, for example, three levels. In this case, I have a group section key, and uh, I can create and I can assign values at any, at any part of this, um, of, this, of this structure. Now, this structure is being automatically included in any C module which, uh, of, of the framework, and basically what it does, um, yeah, it's inherited later on by any 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 module that actually um, utilizes utilizes this inheritance scheme. There are a bunch of tables which are defined in the application and um, serve as specific data storages for for them. So I'll have, for example, a module defined. Uh, sorry, I'll have a module table defined as part of the uh, the C module, and then there are dedicated uh, structures which exist and which are defined. Uh, at multiple points within the framework. So as part of the services, and I'm going to talk about them a bit uh, a bit later. To create this kind of dynamic data structures, the C module comes with a set of APIs that actually simplifies the, uh, the development process. To give an example, and actually this is part of the um, available, uh, sorry, as part of the uh, example I showed you a bit earlier. So we define actually after getting reference to your module, then basically you're defining the, uh, a group, you can define a section, you can define a key, and if you want, for example, for the keys, for your specific keys, you can uh, later on, I know, assign the value, things like that. So instead of having, again, a static data structure, that maybe more, most of you are used, for example, you, when, when, when dealing with the, the usual actors, again, the internal data structure is being created at runtime with a configuration that I'm going to give Okay, um, so if you will, it's going to be rather cryptic. So what you can do actually, uh, you can actually create data structures of any complexity, right? And the fact that it is, um, 
flexible, it actually uh, it allows you to create quite quite complex configurations. Uh, now, so this is actually maybe a broader overview of the system. So imagine that you have, for example, a bunch of C modules or actors, actors of type C module that exist within your system. You can define uh, this kind of data structures, so internal data structures in each of your modules, and then the, say, the fact that uh, it's dynamic, it means that, for example, once I create a data structure in one of my modules, I can actually easily reproduce it in, for example, in other modules in my system, in my application that would require it. And to do so, actually, the framework, so as part of the framework, I have defined a broadcast, a subscribe broadcast, um, subscribe broadcast system. So it's actually, and this is actually one of the services that I, I mentioned at the at the beginning. The way it works is that, for example, during initialization, my C module, for example, would initialize its own internal data structure, and then a C module, for example, would decide that, hey, for example, uh, I would like to pub to publish some I know, some data, for example, some key here. I would like to publish it so that it will be available for other modules in the system. Okay, now this is done. Um, I, I'm defining the structure, I'm defining my keys, I would publish, for example, some, for example, I would define some keys being public. And again, by the way, this is everything handled by the, by the framework itself, so this is done in the background, and the only thing that the developer has to do is just, you know, invoke a bunch of API calls, which are, which I will illustrate a little bit later. So, build a structure. Um, sorry guys, just a second. I think something came up. Uh, I don't know. I think we're good. So I'll define, for example, um, my data structure. I'll define the key. I'll define the values for those keys. And then uh, if I want to share any of these values or any of the keys, then I'll declare the particular key as public. What does it mean? It means that now every time when the, uh, a specific C module would uh, push an update or update the value of this particular key, then the key will be, or the, the respective update would be um, published or be pushed directly to the resource manager. Okay, so again, this is done automatically in the background as part of the framework. Now, I have the modules, for example, Z and Y that require, say, that particular key or multiple keys from the model X. What they will do, they will send actually subscription requests to the resource manager, and then here they will subscribe to that particular key. Every time when a new update is being pushed to the resource manager, then those particular updates will be automatically broadcasted to the subscribers. Okay, so again, this allows me from the, let's say, from the beginning, from the onset, from the runtime, from, sorry, from the initialization of my application, this allows me to define a dynamic data structure and I can actually easily share it with other modules in my system. So if you will, some sort of a synchronization. Well, it's not true synchronization, but it's really just data sharing. All of the communication between the modules is being done by using general messages or using the, oh yeah, the messages that I defined or the general messages that I defined a bit earlier. So essentially there is no dependency between them. The module Z and the module Y, for example, so these two modules, they do not know that there is a module X, right? The only thing that they know is that there is this service, the resource manager or the broadcaster, and what they know is that they subscribe to that particular key, right, in this case. And uh, whenever there is an update, they simply receive the data. That's pretty much what they do. So again, it's a decoupled way of communication. Uh, the resource manager or this particular, uh, this particular service, which in itself is an actor, right, it runs in the background, acts as a global, global storage for the configuration data that is deemed to be public by specific actors in the system. Okay, so what I have is a dynamic data type, I have API for it, and I have the ability to share it relatively easy with other modules in my, in my application. Now, another interesting fact about this is that since I have, for example, this resource manager, and since it stores all of the configuration, the global configuration data for my application, so the configuration which is deemed public, then what it means is that now, since all of this data is centralized, I can actually easily store it if I want to. And this solves another problem that is common to many automated test applications. Like, for example, most of the time you need to initialize your application with some data. So you need to launch it with some predefined information like IPs, I don't know, um, so IPs, addresses to specific devices, parameters for those devices, and so on and so forth. 
So in, in, in typical situations, for example, you, you would solve this problem by using uh, configuration files, right, or CSV files. The problem with this is that they are not very flexible and they do not allow you to easily reproduce complex hierarchies of data. Or in this particular case, if I have a complex hierarchy of data, like a tree data structure, and for example, I want to be able to reproduce it somewhere, then um, again, a database would be actually the most suited for uh, for such purposes. So, and essentially, that's what I do. Um, I have a resource manager and shut down, for example, I can choose to save the configuration data and the database which reproduces the same structure as the one defined in the module. So it does this automatically. And during initialization, then I'm reading the data from that database, I'm publishing it on the resource manager, and then whoever module needs it subscribes to initialization and receive the updates from it. It's a pretty interesting concept. Again, I did not see that uh, often implemented out there in the frameworks which exist broadly, uh, but it actually solves a lot of problems. So it's dynamic, it's flexible, it allows you to easily share data between the, your modules. Um, it offers a policy or it offers also like um, a uh, subscription and broadcast policy, for example, and it offers even protection mechanisms. So in here, I gave you the example of this dynamic of the, this tree structure, and I gave you the example of a public key. So for example, a key which is defined as public in a specific module, and which basically pushes a base the resource manager and broadcast further. But the key can be private as well, and the module can choose to define a key as being public or private. In which case, so if it's private, then again, it's being used only internally, updates to it are not being pushed to the resource manager, okay? Um, moving, uh, I think moving a bit further, uh, so moving a bit further, uh, the other challenge that I uh, actually met while working with the Echo framework, and as I mentioned, was the debug part, so the um, troubleshooting, so the debugging and the troubleshooting of, of actors. And to do so, basically the framework provides, already comes with a built-in, uh, with a built-in debugger, okay? So what does it do? Uh, or how it is implemented. If I'll check the uh, actor framework or the vanilla actor framework, what it does, it comes, so I'm going to go to the parent class. So what it has, it's actually, it's a remarkable method. And that method is being called here. Um, just a second, ask, ask the C panel. So that method is being called the receive message. And this method is being uh, invoke every time an actor receives, basically, an outside message. Now, what it does, well, what it can do, what I can do with it, and actually that's a property which is quite interesting, I can override it. So basically, every message that comes as part of an actor, then um, it will go through my method or my implementation of the method. So what I did, actually, I implemented a debugger in here, or a debug trace, if you will. So you can see it here. Now, this debug trace can be turned on or off. Um, and basically what it means, it means that basically if I want, I can trace any message that is received by any, any particular actor, okay? Um, the way it is implemented, actually, sorry, just a second. The way it is implemented, is actually something like this. And again, you don't have to go right now for the code. This is again, something which is abstracted to the developer, but what it does is actually I'm checking, for example, for a given C module, again, for a given actor, if the debug mode is on or off, if on, then I'm gathering data and then I'm sending it to the debugger. So that's that's what it is. That's what it happens. And um, the framework provides you actually uh, in this way provides you actually with tools to track and monitor the execution, for example, or um, the, the messaging which is happening in your uh, in your application. So let me just actually at this point show you a quick demo, and I think you'll understand a bit better the way the way it works. Okay, so this is my application. What it did, it did launch a bunch of actors. The actors, again, are here. Not a big deal, but again, just to show where they are. So uh, I'm going to log in, okay? Now, uh, if I'll turn on the debugger, right now, the embedded debugger, 
So here I can see a list of the available methods, or sorry, a list of available actors in my application or in my framework, and I can see also the messaging which is happening between actors. And basically, besides that, what I get also see it's a bunch of statistics information. So I can see the state of individual actors running, for example, in this case. And uh, what I can do as well, I can actually see the amount of messages or the uh, yeah, the messaging which is happening in the system. So using this approach, like for example, I can spot uh, actors which are, for example, overused, which are receiving extra messages, or for example, I can see messages or actors which are becoming um, unresponsive or something, something. Uh, the way this is done, again, this is done via uh, this particular implementation, so using this particular debug trace. So in my actor in my cPanel, I did simply an override of the uh, received message. I included here my debug trace. Whenever an actor receives um, a message, then I'm simply forwarding it to the debugger, to that particular system monitor. So the application window that I showed you a bit earlier. Now, since this actually adds a performance hit, then again, I can choose to turn on and off one or off the, um, this debug trace for a particular actor, okay? Now, the, uh, so the message, or uh, sorry, the information about the messaging is being gathered and then later on is being sent to my debugger. So that's essentially the gist of it. Um, then, again, another service which exists as part of the framework is this particular one, is the system monitor. And what it does, it actually gathers all of the debugger information for all of the, from all of the um, actors in the system and then displays it in a way which would be easy to understand. So. I get module statistics, I get the messaging which is happening in my system, and then if I will later on even displace the global data, so the data which is uh, declared or the data which is publicly available within the resource manager. So using this, basically I have solved the original I know, three challenges that I faced when working with the actor framework. So uh, I solved the dependency, the, uh, dependency problem, I solved the data sharing between the actors, and then I even provided, so I created tools that allow you to um, allow me to trace the execution of, or yeah, the execution or the yeah, the running state of the actors within my system. Okay, and basically once I got this far, I couldn't stop anymore. Essentially, so I figured like, okay, I built all of this now. Okay, so what's next? Uh, the problem, or if I can call it a problem, in typical in typical applications that, for example, most of the people or most of the companies. Uh, are working with with LabVIEW, they do not are not just you know like um, processes that are running in the background. So most of the time, uh, what happens is that typically okay, so this this is something that works. But besides that, what you have you also have a bunch of um, let's say you also need to display something to the user. So okay, you have the processes they are communicating something something, but to make your application useful, then typically you have a user interface which you need to display to to, to the user. Now, uh, what does it mean? It means that, uh, well, you'll have to have a panel and you'll have to handle a particular panel. You'll have to actually work with it. And most of the time as developers, we end up actually facing a bunch of repetitive tasks, which again, steal from us a lot of, a lot of time. So let me just show you an example of this. So I still assume that a lot of you saw this, right? So I have a, I don't know, I have a front panel, I have a user interface, and I need to manage it, or I do have to do something with it, right? One of the first things that you do, right, at this point is that, well, uh, you have the, the, the controls and indicators, and then you have the references, and then you need to pull the references manually, you have to put them in a cluster, and then you have to pass them around to do something with them. So how would you do? Well, this, you get the cluster, you get the reference that you need, and then you do something with that particular one. Now, the problem here is actually, um, this cluster has to be maintained. So first of all, so if you add controls and indicators to your front panel, then it means that you have to update the type definition for that cluster. So you need to actually create, uh, yeah, create corresponding fields in that particular cluster. So that's actually in time becomes quite quite hard to maintain. And again, if you're we're talking about smaller application, this is manageable. But if you're talking about applications when you have multiple panels to be displayed to the user and you have to actually maintain this, then this becomes actually a repetitive task. So this is something that you have to do for all of your, um, let's say, panels in your application. Okay, and again, this is quite um, quite cumbersome, let's put it like this. So that's one thing. Then, for example, 
once you have the references put in place, then you have to do something with it. So there are multiple issues here. So what do you do? Actually, you have to get the reference and basically typically you use something like this, like unbundle my name, which is something which is static. Unfortunately, so it's a static configuration. Then you have to find the pro you have to invoke or you have to use a property node, find the property or the method that you need, apply it, and so on and so forth. And this is actually this is wasting a lot of time. Moreover, some of the um, implementations are quite slow. So I think that we all did actually at this point, so something like this. And I believe that actually this, I mean, again, uh, if you're familiar with the way, for example, Avi works and how, for example, the VI server works, then I guess you know that this is something that we, we would like to avoid because this is actually slow. For example, if you want to set or get values to be properties or yeah, so through, through the property nodes. And again, these are just some of the examples that we're facing when dealing with, um, uh, with this kind of applications. Uh, thing is, most of the frameworks that exist out there currently, they, um, so they're very much, um, they're very good at providing you tools for passing data from point E to point B, let's say being messaging or being user events or being queues and so on and so forth. But up until today, um, most of the frameworks that exist here, they do not provide the developer with tools that would allow to, for example, efficiently build user interfaces. Right, and actually, as a developer, this is where you end up spending a lot of time because you have to uh, build the user interface, you have to maintain it, you have to customize it, you have to actually invoke a lot, invoke a lot of properties and methods, you have to manage references for this, and this becomes, I would say, quite cumbersome. So I figured, like, okay, why, why wouldn't a framework actually provide me tools for handling this as well, or why wouldn't I build a framework that would provide me tools for handling this as well? Okay, and here actually a note to my um, one of my friends that is working in web development. Um, yeah, inspired by him, actually, I started to work a little bit more where I started to go a bit deeper into uh, the web frameworks. And this is where, for example, I found out found, found out about React, and this became this became quite um, let's say uh, interesting, let's say yeah, interesting and inspiring encounter for me. So if you imagine, for example, a web page in a typical a typical, typical web application, if it's something built with React, then what you'll see over there is components. So you have a web page which is being displayed, and then you have different areas which different which, which represent different components, right? So that's 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 what they do. And then basically using the, the web frameworks, what you can do, you can actually simply choose to display a specific component, a specific React component in a specific area. Okay. So what happens with this? Well, well, it's pretty, um, it, it allows for a modular user interface and something which is being um, handled, let's say, by the framework itself. Now, another thing about the React components is that they actually offer you tools for handling this. It offers you tools for handling different properties of your, of your user interface. So then I figured that, hey, okay, actually, that's not a bad idea. What if I would implement something like this in, in, in LabVIEW as well? What if for example, instead of having a process which executes, which simply executes inside the VI, because that's typically how we treat it, what if actually, what if I would make the VI itself um, part of my process, okay, a property of the process? So I'll create actually a component which in includes both functional as well as UI components, or well, let's say UI handling components for my for my application, okay. Plus, okay, how how about, for example, we get rid of this kind of implementations and went and would go for something a bit more efficient? Okay, and this is how the cPanel class actually was born. Again, this is something that I built already on top of the um, of the cModule class. So if you imagine this, so I described a bit uh, a bit earlier how the cModule class actually works, and now I'm actually here and something that is actually built on top of it, but it's really it's a specialized module specifically for user interfaces or for handling user interfaces. Okay, so what is this cPanel class? Well, actually, um, it's something I think quite cool. So instead of having this, basically, doing this manually, right, as part of your development cycle, how about we actually reduce it to something like this? Actually, that would be really cool. So the way it works is that basically whenever a specific cPanel is being launched, the first thing that it does, it actually gets the reference to the VI in which it is being executed. From here, actually, I can pull all of the references that I need. So this is done already in the background by my um, by, by the framework. 
So I'm providing it the VI in which I'm executing. And then from here, I'm passing the VI and I'm getting the references to all of the indicators and controls um, uh, which are part of the particular front panel. So what it means is that I don't have to do this manually anymore. This is done automatically here, basically, by the, by the API itself. Okay, so after this point, what I have is an object which contains basically all of the reference that I might need to do stuff with it. For example, say, what if I need at some point the reference to a control or indicator in my application? Okay, no problem. I'm passing it the object, and then here I'm specifying simply the label of that control or indicator that I want to access, I'm getting the reference. That's it. Zero maintenance on my side. Simply tell it what I need or what you need, and then it will give you the the, the reference. Okay, we'll think a bit further. Uh, if I'm to expand, again, typical tasks that are being done by developers when managing user interfaces, well, again, setting or getting values or con uh, sorry, control values. Okay, and the example that I gave you a bit earlier, so specifically this one, in a normal situation, you do something like this. And if you remember, this is actually kind of slow, plus again, you're relying on some references existing in your in your application. Okay, no problem. Again, the framework provides for this as well. So instead of doing that, actually I'm getting, I can get a reference, for example, and operate on that reference, or even better, what if, uh, for example, I, 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 I designed some API that actually can handle this for me. So I'm getting it, I'm, I'm providing, so for a given control, Again, there is no reference, so I'm not handling references directly here. I'm getting the name of the control, for example, and I'm simply getting it a value. And again, this is done in an optimized way, and actually this is used, um, this is done using the set and get control values by indexes. So again, this is something built in, in the framework, and this is something that actually allows you to perform such operations in, a, in, a, in, a, in an optimized fashion, fashion. By the way, speaking of which, um, did you know that actually this particular VI was available in LabVC 2013. Honestly, I was not aware. I actually went this, I only discovered this recently, but this guy exists, but once they found out, it turned out to be an, an, an amazing tool. So why is that? Well, essentially, it allows you to access uh, control indicator values with a speed very much comparable to a uh, actual local, to writing or reading from a local variable. Now, the disadvantage, more, actually more details about this, we can talk probably afterwards about the performance characteristics of this particular API implementation. But uh, what I wanted to tell you here is that uh, the reason why, for example, this kind of implementations you did not see, so maybe you did not see them very often in, let's say, typical applications, is because, well, they're not very known, unfortunately, and also instead of setting controls and indicator values by references, it actually uses control indexes. Now, the control index, this is something which is, it's a property of a particular control, and actually to get the index of a control, you need the property node, you need to actually a property node to get to return of that index. Okay, and then you need basically a data structure to store this and access this at will. Um, well, now, again, this is handled within the cPanel, so you don't have to worry about this. So this is the uh, under the hood implementation, but basically, the only thing that you need to do is actually simply invoke some API calls and tell it that, hey, for this control, I want to set this value, or for this control, I want to get this value. So essentially, um, the cPanel comes with a set of APIs, so a set of tools that allows you to actually uh, streamline or optimize the typical developer operations when dealing with, um, yeah, with dealing with user interfaces. But then again, this is not the only thing that you do typically with controls and indicators. Uh, you might want to, for example, enable or disable some controls and indicators. Maybe you want to make them invisible and so on and so forth. So in the cPanel class, you have actually a bunch of um, methods which are predefined and actually with, uh, which allow you to actually perform these actions directly without um, without having to touch references references at all. Okay. So the way this is implemented, again, uh, all of this exists in the cPanel class. All of this exists in the methods, so encapsulated in the methods for the cPanel class. And to give you an example of how it works, I'm going to go here into the uh, system modules, and then, for example, here, the system monitor that I mentioned a bit earlier, and you can see an example of an implementation. So 
that's my actor. So this is where basically, well, the entry point to my actor, I'm getting a reference to the VI and that's it. So this is the last time basically I'm touching references. If I need a specific reference to do something, then I'm simply interrogating using a string with the name of the control that I need. I'm getting the reference and then I'm doing stuff with it. Uh, what you end up with is a code which is simpler, easier to understand, easier to maintain, basically, yeah, much more readable, much more scalable. So generally it saves, it saves a lot of time. Okay, but then again, you know, in a typical lab application or in a typical developer application, that's not the only thing that you would have to do or you would be, uh, yeah, you would need to implement. So most of the time, simply displaying a simple panel or a simple, sorry, a simple front panel, most of the time this is not enough. So what you would actually need to do, it's actually, what you have to do is actually build a more complex user interface. So what I mean by, by, by more complex, typically you need to create panels or you need to complex, you need to create user interfaces which are dynamic. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that uh, you need to, for example, display something or you have to display a menu, then you have to display a graph, then you need to re replace the graph by some controls or some indicator and so on and so forth. So typically you have to create, um, again, I'm talking about a user interface which is more, more complex, if you will. Now, and the solutions in this case, or the typical solutions when developing such applications are using panels, or sorry, using tab controls or using some panels. But in both of these cases, again, it can become quite problematic if you want to build complex user interfaces with complex behavior, okay? So again, this is something that I faced while working on the, my developer projects, and that's something that I actually figured that, hey, since this is something I'll be battling for a long time, I figured that, okay, how about I, um, all the time to tackle this and solve this with this particular framework. So how would you do this? Okay, so for this purpose, I created another class which is called the um, user interface class. So what does it what does it mean? Or what's the concept here? In a typical, let's say, in a typical, typical test application, for example, in the design phase, for example, you would define um, a specific layout. Say this is the outline of your user interface, and this is, for example, the layout of the surfaces that you want to use as part of user interface. Um, in this particular case, so I define the default layout, and then I define the areas, for example, that will create or that will represent my layout. These areas, I chose them to be a sub panel because they are, they, they are actually, I think, the most flexible or the most suited for such applications. Okay, so I have a default layout, I have my sub panels in this case, and now what I need is something to manage them, something that would allow me at runtime to easily load a specific panel in a specific sub panel. Okay, so actually, if I think about it, okay, I have the C panel class which handles its own references and has a VI reference which is specific to that particular object. Okay, so what I need to do, actually, I need to build a user interface class or something that will actually manage, for example, a, um, a sub-panel based configuration. Okay, so essentially that's what I did. I built a user interface class and essentially what it is, it's actually, it's a, it's a sub-panel manager. Okay, now assume that I'm in this particular situation and I assume that I have a bunch of panel actors that I want to load somewhere here. Okay, the way it works, actually, I would have an actor, right, like an actor X, and then I have a panel, or a front panel in this case, or a C panel module, a C panel actor that I want, I would like to be displayed somewhere in a, in a sub panel. Okay, what I did, I built a service. Again, there is a class and there is also a service which runs in the background as part of the, um, as part of the framework. So what happens is that the actor X, um, it can send or it sends a request to my service, to the system user interface service in this particular case. The system user interface accepts the requests or accepts this particular request, then inquires the cPanel that needs to be loaded and asks him or asks it to send it its VI reference. Once it receives its VI reference, then it gets loaded in my subpanel. Okay, so think about as a, yeah, as a, yeah, sort of a service or sort of a state machine that runs somewhere in the background. I'm sending it a request that, hey, I would like to load this C panel and this panel in this sub panel, right? 
And then the state machine or this service, what it does, it handles the rest. So it asks for the reference of the cPanel to be loaded, it gets it, and then it loads that particular cPanel in the required subpanel. And essentially, this is what's happening here. So every time when I'm pressing one of the um, menu buttons here, so for example, if I'm pressing that menu, then what it does, actually, I'm asking the system user interface to load this particular front panel here, and I want to load this particular front panel or this cPanel module, I want it to be loaded here. Okay, so getting back to the, I don't know, to the original slide, we're getting back here, imagine that I'll have a bunch of actors, so somewhere here or something like this, and then I can choose um, which actor, basically which cPanel actor to be loaded in which subpanel. And basically this allows you to create um, really complex menu configurations which can be easily changed at runtime. So you can actually create any kind of behavior you will or any kind of behavior that is required for your application. So um, to give you another example, so here is another menu. I'm going to play configuration one. What it will happen actually, it will load three different actors into three different subpanels. So this is a subpanel here, this is another subpanel, and this is another subpanel. By clicking this button, again, I'm loading a specific cPanel module in a respective um, in a respective subpanel, and then clicking configuration tool, it loads the same cPanel actors but in a different configuration. And this is done actually very um, simple, okay, simple, relatively simply, um, using simple API calls. So let me just quickly illustrate you in the in the panel menu here. So whenever I'm clicking, for example, one of the buttons, so whenever I'm clicking the button configuration one, then what's happening, I'm telling it, hey, please load me this red panel into this subpanel, load me this panel, so the blue panel, into another subpanel, and so on and so forth. That's everything that you have to do. And the this API is available in the cPanel class. So basically, I can easily call this kind of action on any other module in my, in my application. So I can create easily dynamic applications. Okay, so again, this is something that is part of the framework, and this is something that you can customize for your own application. This is easily custom customizable. So if you need a different subpanel configuration, sure, no problem. Simply come, modify it, give it a name, and then address it in your module. So address the load, basically, in, or the configuration that needs to be loaded um, in your particular module. Okay. Um, Again, I don't think we'll have to time to cover everything uh, during during this session. So again, we'll have time to talk about this. I think during the Q and A uh, part, or we can, you can contact me online and we can discuss it. But probably the last part that I wanted to I know, present to you here is actually the way it operates. Now, for example, uh, okay, we have now the we have the modules, we have the C panels, we have the user interface, we have a bunch of processes that are running in the background. We have configuration which is being shared between different modules. And uh, the only thing that is needed is actually something that will put together, that will assemble, will put together all of these things, and then it will actually manage the interactions between all of these um, all of these components. Now, why is this important? Well, if you dealt with multi-process application, then it's actually it can be quite challenging to handle um, initialization or to handle, for example, uh, shutdown of multiple interdependent processes or processes that rely on each other for specific data or for specific configuration. Okay, so another process that exists here as part of the application is actually this one, and it's called the system core. So this is the process that actually handles the initialization, it handles the shutdown of my, um, of my actors, and this is where actually I'm storing all of the configuration for um, all, all of the configuration data, for example, uh, I don't know, like in queues, module states, and so on and so forth that are related to the operation of my system. So essentially, the information that is being displayed here in the debugger and the system monitor here in the statistics part is actually information that comes from the system core. So the modules which are available, the state of these particular modules, and then also the statistics. So for example, the number of messages per second received by um, individual models. In case if I'll get an error somewhere in my application, so I'm going to simulate an error right now. 
Okay, then what's going to happen? The system core will notify the system monitor that in one of the actors an error occurred. So that, for example, I would know that hey, in this particular actor in sign gen, in this case, um, I received an error. Okay, so something like this. Also, the system core, what it does, it acts as a um, watchdog. So one thing that the framework handles is, um, let's say, the responsiveness of the system. Uh, to avoid situations when you get, for example, um, a process, an actor that gets unresponsive. To do so, the system core uh, periodically um, sends heartbeats, heartbeat messages to all of the actors in the system. There is a specific timeout, and if a given actor does not reply in that given timeout, then what's going to happen? Then the timeout error will be will be thrown, and the user can be notified, or the operator, the application can be notified that hey, some process over there is hanging. So I'm going to clear right on this error. Okay, and I'm going to simulate a timeout error. So this is something that we should see in approximately 15 seconds, probably 10 seconds now. So a time, the timeout error, it's actually simulated in a pretty simple way. I'm going to show you in a second. But a timeout error just occurred. And what I have here is that I have this particular module, like um, the thought sign gen, again, same guy, which became for some reason unresponsive. Okay, then, I don't know, the, um, the error went away. So now, for example, uh, it became responsive again after a while. But then again, the error is being recorded. There is a log file, and this kind of um, situation, this kind of events are being are being logged. The way I simulated this particular error was actually a simple delay function. So in my sign actor, so somewhere here, uh, the time, the methods, I have this simulate time error, and that's a typical situation. So that's a process that simply takes too long. Okay, so. My actor failed to reply. I got a time of error that got thrown away and well, it got recorded. So this is the system core. And another thing that I would like to mention here is actually is that what you get is um, a lot of methods which exist as part of the um, which exist as part of the C module and Basically, which allows you to customize the, um, which allows you to customize the behavior of your system by overriding these particular methods. So, just to give a second, so here there is a diagram which I think, I'll, which I'll make public at some point, which represents all of the, or not, or most of the methods which are being defined within a C module, and with green the methods that can be overridden. Also, it defines, so it also represents a uh, initialization and shutdown diagram, which specifies which methods and which are being called, because there are methods which are being called during the initialization phase. This is the order in which they're being called, and then there are methods which can be overridden and can, I don't know, um, can be modified to customize the behavior of your actor during the execution of your application. Okay, guys, so I think that our time is up. I hope, I know, I got introduced a little bit to the things that can be done with the core framework. Again, this is just an introduction. I think I rushed away through some of the topics, but then again, it was a lot of stuff to be covered, so I had to compress it in a, in a smaller time frame. But then again, uh, if you have any questions, if there's something that you'd like to discuss, you know, I'll be more than happy to discuss with you. Or, I don't know, if you have any feedback for what you saw over here, then again, please let me know in the Q&A, in the chat, and, uh, I know we can we can talk it over. So okay, let me just go a little bit here. We go into the back menu. Here we go. A typical application, and again, typical data or typical operations that are being performed um, in a typical data or in a typical uh, lab view, uh, lab view, lab system or lab application. Uh, okay, so. <clears throat> okay, guys. Um, do you have any questions so far? Do you have any, I don't know, feedback, something that you'd like to find more? Okay. So let me just tackle it a little bit. So I understand. Uh, that you have a central uh, storage of all the data from modules that normally would be a private data leaving. Okay, 
have you experienced any congestion slowing down performance of individual actors? Uh, yes, so that's true. So this is something that can happen. So all of the data is being stored within the resource manager. So what that happens is that if you put all of the data over there and you have a lot of subscribers that are pulling that particular data, uh, then this can lead to an overload of the resource manager. Uh, to address this, actually, and just to just to say, so yes, this kind of situation can happen, but then again, the use case for the resource manager was to store only configuration data, which means that the data which is being placed over there is something that will not change, or it's not supposed to change often over time. So what it means, it means that technically, again, it was implemented as, um, again, as a storage for configuration, not for streaming data, if you will. For this kind of application or for this kind of situations, this is, uh, this is more than enough. Okay, um, question from Fab. So what is the difference between your debugger and the desktop execution text toolkit supported? Uh, okay, that was added to the Echo framework. Well, um, this is my debugger, if you will. This is a light version of a debug tool, right? So it does not show actual API calls, or it does not show, let's say, low level API calls. What it does, it simply points out to the messaging that is happening between actors. Uh, we do not see payload data, for example. And um, yeah, so we do not see payload data or we do not see low level DI calls. So from this perspective, it's more lightweight and uh, I think it requires less, less resources. The desktop execution trace toolkit as it is, I think it's a bit too heavy for applications that have a lot of processes which are running, which are running in parallel. Um, yeah, but again, the main difference is that it's less complex, so it's much simpler. It's built in and for a quick debug, for some quick troubleshooting, it's something that I don't know, you can easily you can easily use. Have you ever used a Gemma Interactor and Panel Actor? Yes. To answer Hope's question, yes. Actually, uh, fun fact, I discovered MGI Monitor Actor after I started to work on my on my framework. I think that if I would have discovered that sooner, then maybe a lot of things probably would have would uh, I, I wouldn't have done them. But that's true. So it's very similar to what the MGI guys guys are doing. So as a concept, as an idea, so that's true. Uh, however, in my case, I just have um, I have a different implementation. Uh, another question here: So using three names is not zero maintenance because if another developer changes the label of the control indicator, then things break. That's true. That's true. Uh, this is a risk that uh, I have to take, or uh, this is the risk that the developer has to take. And to be honest, I was very much afraid of strings before as well, because indeed this can lead to all, all sorts of situations, so other maintenance problems. But um, to tell you to tell you fairly, after, after using this framework for uh, a bunch of projects, it turned out that actually it's not as bad as it sounds. So you can actually uh, you can actually manage it quite quite nicely. The framework actually helps you in this case. So for example, if you have the name of a control indicator and you misspell it for some reason in uh, in your string, then you'll be notified. So there is an indicator, part of the API that lets you know if the control or indicator that you're looking for has been found or not. Okay, so again, there is a protection mechanism in there. So I understand your point. This was actually a concern on my side as well. But again, to be fair, after using it, um, I think the advantages in the end, they outweigh the, uh, the, the potential risks. Okay. Um, how do you specify the cPanel to be loaded? Does each have a unique name or do you just specify it by its secure? No. Um, actually, uh, the cPanel is on. Um, uh, so I'm doing this actually by by name. That's that's essentially how it goes. Um, let me just share with you a little bit my screen. So I'm going to share with you my LabVIEW, my LabVIEW application. I think you are seeing it right now. Okay, let me stop it. Okay, so um, first of all, the naming. How am I addressing the naming of my actors? So uh, the naming, it's actually, it's something which is being based on the class. So actually I'm taking the name of the class for my particular actor. Um, I have here, um, da, 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 during the initialization, I'm gonna show you in a moment this, this is done in the cPanel. Uh, da, da, da. So here, during the initialization, just a second. Okay, 
So here, so I'm doing this, I'm initializing uh, a bunch of stuff. And among the initialization, what I do, I'm also taking the, um, I'm parsing the name of my uh, of my object, and I'm taking the name of the, or the base name of my class. So this is what defines the name of the C panel. Okay, this is being stored as a property within my um, um, within within my object. So this is actually here. Okay, so I'm taking the uh, this is my class. Uh, I'm parsing the object. I'm taking the base class, and this becomes the name of my. Um, sorry, just a second. Uh, just a second. I think maybe you lost me here. I'm gonna share it in my screen. Mm. OK, so uh, this is the, yeah, I hope you see it right now. So what you see here, this is the initialization. During the initialization, not even of the C panel, but during the initialization of the C module, then what's, going, what's happening, I'm parsing the object. So again, this is the OpenG API. I'm taking the base class, and this essentially becomes the name of my, of my module. And again, since the C panel inherits from C module, then this is being taken automatically and this is being stored as part of the property of my, um, again, part of the property of my object. Now, when I need a C panel to be loaded, so let me show you here in the duck menu, for example. So when I need a C panel to be loaded, then just a second, no, not this one. Let me show you my main menu. Here. Here. So when I need a C panel to be loaded in a sub panel, then I'm specifying that particular name. So if I know that the name of my actor is this one, that menu in this case, so that's what it is. So if I know that this is the name of my actor, then actually that's what I do. So that menu, so load me this particular, load for me this particular module into this particular sub panel. That's essentially, that's essentially what's, what's happening. So this is purely by string. And then again, I was afraid by strings, and believe me, yeah, I do typos. Some I, I I'm defining typos, so I'm creating type. Uh, I'm making typos. I'm making mistakes sometimes. But if I misspell, for example, the name of an actor, then uh, I'll simply get an error that hey, this actor does not exist, and then it's pretty easy to go and fix it because well, that's that's how it goes. Of course, if I change the name of an actor, then yes, this can become problematic because I have to go back and change everywhere the string that. Um, yeah, the, the string that corresponds or the name that corresponds to that actor. Again, there are ways around it, but currently that's how it's done. And to be fair, I think it, it worked pretty pretty nicely so far. Okay, uh, let's see. Just a second. Okay. Okay, so yes, I'm going to address the Discord channel as well. Uh, just okay. Maybe I'm gonna go. I'm gonna take the questions here, and then I'm gonna go to the uh, questions on Discord side as well. So, do you implement the model view control in your framework, or do you use the front panel as your uh, da -da -da, so state of the program? Actually, yes. So, to answer the question from Goofy Wires, yes. Actually, what it is, it's a model view controller framework. It's pretty much solid. Even though, for example, you have the C panel class, which bundles a little bit the process side of the framework with the uh, user interface side of the, of the framework. Again, as an example that I gave before React, uh, in a typical application, in a normal application, I prefer to I prefer to separate the two. So let me just give you, okay, so here an example. So in the project that you have here, I have the, I have different classes. So I have the C panel class, for example, I have C module class. So to, uh, respect the principle of the MVC, so the uh, model view controller, let's say, approach to solving this problem, then what I do, for example, I would define, for example, for processes that run in the background, I would use the C module class, again, because these are, this is stuff that doesn't have to be displayed. So this is a process that runs in the background. And for user interface or stuff that has to be displayed, then I'm using the C panel class. Again, in a system user interface or in a sub panel as part of the framework, I can only load um, I can only load C panel modules, right? I cannot load the C modules simply because they do not have the methods or they do not have the methods defined as part of the interface, and they also do not have the reference to the actor actor core actor core BI. Okay, 
So I'm using, again, I'm using C panels for, uh, sorry, I'm using C modules for processes that run in the background. So again, services, stuff that does not have to be displayed. Okay, and I have C panels which are being displayed and they interact with the C modules by using interface messages. Okay, so from this perspective, I'm respecting the um, I'm respecting the MVC approach to designing applications. Um, again, to give you like more specific examples for my project, so here, for example, the sign gen and the random gen, which essentially they um, they generate simply this is generates a sign wave and this one generates some random data. Now these are C modules; they are not supposed to be displayed. They operate in the background, and that's what I do. They have an interface. Here, so they have an interface, and this is how I'm addressing these particular modules, right? But I cannot display them. So this is how, for example, a C panel, a C panel module uh, would interact with them. So that's that's essentially that's essentially what what, what they do. Um, okay, how would you find the control indicator that you access? Is the only way by doing a text search? Um, Okay, so the implementation is pretty much the following. So I think I can show you this part. It's actually not very complicated, and yeah, I would like to see it actually done, uh, done, done more often. So let me share with you again my cPanel module. So I'm going to share with you actually my desktop. I think it's better. Okay, so here what I do is the uh, so this is the front panel view. Okay, so this is the again the base implementation from the cPanel class. Here I have a method which is called get from panel references from the VI. So here what I do, I'm storing, I'm getting all of the references to all of the controls and indicators. Then here I'm storing those references inside my uh, as an array or as arrays inside my uh, inside my object. Okay. As that, I'm also getting again during initialization, I'm getting the text. So I'm getting the labels for those. Uh, I'm getting the labels again for those controls and indicators. So I'm getting references, labels, I'm also getting the indexes, and everything is being stored in separate arrays um, in, my, in my object. When I need to access one, so I need to access, um, so if I need to access a control, for example, I need to reference a control or indicator, and I need that access. So the way this is done, so here, for example, get control by label, then I'm um, I'm getting the labels. I'm doing a simple search. That's true. Uh, I'm getting the index, and then I'm getting the corresponding reference. So that's how it goes. And actually, this is quite fast. I do not have to. So I don't have to rely on the BI server. I do not have to go through property nodes and things like this because this was already done during initialization. This search is actually it's actually quite fast. So for sure, this would not be this would not be a bottleneck. Moreover. Here, for example, when I want to set a value, so let me show you another example here in the um, so system user interface. In my case, so I'm going to go into the um, so here. This is the interface that you saw. I'm going to go into my implementation here. Okay. So for example, here, what's happening? I need to set a value of a color box. So this is my color box, notify error, and providing it a label, and then a value that I want to set. The way it works is that, again, same principle, um, I'm getting, uh, I have my control to look for, so the name of the control. Uh, here, I'm, again, looking, I'm searching the in the list of the, uh, yeah, in the array of defined controls. I'm getting the index of that particular control. Having the index, then I'm calling this bad boy, which actually sets the value for my control indicator. So then again, there is very small performance overhead. So this is actually very fast. This is why I called it actually an optimized way of setting. So, so searching a 1D array of strings, I think that's pretty fast. And then setting the value of that particular control once I have the index. Again, this is actually quite fast. So this, um, I think this again, uh, yeah, it's 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 an optimization. Plus, again, I don't have to touch myself the references. This is being handled as part of the API, as part of the framework. OK, um, so uh, let me see. OK, let me see what else is there. OK, just a second.
Okay. Um, another question here is: uh, Do you work by yourself or with uh, multiple developers? Um, yeah, actually, uh, I was working. So the concept was mine. I developed the framework working while well, working on some new projects. So basically, I developed the framework in parallel with the project. So essentially, I used a specific. So I had a project I had to work on, and for that particular project, then I I started to develop the framework. And so it happened that while working on the project, I was also building the framework in the process. So first by defining the interface, then building the API that allows me to. Uh, interact with uh, specific components and so on and so forth. So it came as a natural flow. And then when I saw that it actually becomes a framework, I decided to separate it. So I created a frame, the framework as such. But yes, for now, um, yeah, I'm working just me on this, but I hope in the future maybe to get support from, I don't know, colleagues or maybe get support from the community. I'm considering to make this code as open source at some point and uh, maybe uh, yeah, get other people contributing to this as well because I think it can add a lot of value to a lot of applications out there. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. Um, okay, I understand your implementation, but the question is if you forget, so question from Q, so, um, but the question is if you forget where control is being disabled, how do you find it? Uh, yeah, that's actually, that's a very good question. Uh, normally here, what you would do, or what I would do, myself at least, uh, you'd have, uh, again, initialization. So during the initialization phase, typically uh, you can choose the initial state of your application. So you can choose to enable, disable all of your controls or all of your indicators. Um, yeah, that's pretty much how it goes. I mean, uh, yeah, I, ha I have a specific known state. I initialize with that. I know the state, uh, the initialization state. If later on I forget something for some reason, then again, at least I can start from the, um, let's say I can start from the initialization and I can look for the specific, I know, code that modifies the state of my control indicator. Um, okay, if you display a stream of 2D array data, will the framework handle and delay updates, for example? So if you display a stream of 2D array data, Okay, will the framework handle and delay updates, for example, or will the entire framework um, slow down? So here probably I would need to ask what do you mean by displaying a stream of 2D data? So you mean like if I'm sending a message that contains 2D data and I'm being I'm displaying that in a, and I'm displaying that in my uh, I don't know in in a, in a panel or or what exactly do you mean? So to answer your question, basically at this point messaging uh, so. I did use the framework for streaming large amounts of data between modules. I was actually using the framework for streaming data to and from oscilloscopes. So I would have an oscilloscope module that would generate, I don't know, for example, uh, 40,000 samples per second or 400,000 samples per second in one or two, um, yeah, in multiple in, in multiple arrays. So in a 2D array containing this, I was able to stream it to a display module and I did not see any lag. So the framework itself, the message itself was not was not um, was not a bottleneck. Or for example, if you have a data acquisition card with multiple uh, input channels and you do simultaneous acquisition on multiple channels, so you want to collect that uh, I don't know, you want to collect the data as a 2D array and send it to a chart to be displayed to a C panel module to be displayed. Then again, so I did this, I used up to, I don't know, like I used to maximum something great of my data acquisition card. Um, yeah, still, I didn't see any bottlenecks with this. What I did, where, where I did see bottlenecks is indeed, uh, if I have a lot of modules and I have a lot of configuration, which is being set as public within the resource manager. So I have a lot of subscribers and a lot of broadcast is happening then, uh, yeah, so this is where actually, if I'm doing very fast updates of my configuration data, then this is where you can see an increase in your processor usage or an increase of the yeah, overall usage of your system. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, otherwise, no. I, since then, I did optimize uh, the resource manager and how the subscribe behavior, uh, let's say, mechanism operates. I do think that since then, Again, I think I improved the way it operates, but I did not benchmark it yet. So I cannot tell you for sure, I don't know how um, yeah, how efficient it is. I'll, I'll need to provide some specific data in the in the future. Okay. Um, 
I don't know. Um, I don't know. Maybe any other questions, things like this? Okay. No, so heavy data, no, so far I did not get any, any issues. Uh, again, uh, I had the, yeah, I did, I did test it before this. I was actually worried that it might be um, a bottleneck, especially if I have the interface and the messages they go, they have to go through the interface and so on and so forth. Uh, but no, somehow I did not see anything like this. Um, I was able to stream data from a single scope on multiple channels with high sampling rate uh, without, uh, without any issues. Uh, okay, uh, let's see if I, if there are any questions that I missed. Probably not. Okay, let me check. Let me check also the Discord channels, even though I hope that I answered most of the questions over there as well. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so this is something that I did. Okay, okay, okay. That's true. That's true. So again, uh, to address some of the comments, yes, what I did, uh, again, I started to develop this framework before I got introduced to the MGI framework, so I agree. Conceptually and ideally, in many ways, they are similar. Uh, but then again, the implementation differs. So I said, I checked what they did and it might, uh, so what they did, what the MGI guys did, I think they did a great job with it. I went in a different way and then, okay, I decided like, okay, I already have something built in place. I don't want to rewrite it and reuse, you know, already something that, you know, something from outside. So I went, uh, I continued going in this direction because, okay, I already had something in place that, that worked. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, again, use this particular ISO setting value by index. It's a great idea and use it. It's something which exists in Latin for a long time, so that's pretty cool. Okay. Do you have any tools for to have visualize or check the implicit coupling? Do you have between them two modules that are communicating using strings? No. Um, I don't have any tools like this. This is something that I plan to develop. This will be for the future. So unfortunately, I did not get to that phase. Uh, this is part of the tools that I want to develop. Um, yeah, so this is for the future. So that's something that I will have to build. Um, okay, um, question from Mars to could I follow most of your session? You're going away too fast for me to follow. At the beginning, you're talking about decoupling two actors joined by a type. Can you fill in what was the problem exactly from what I saw? Either they were storing different kinds of information. Okay. In which case, they shouldn't use the same type if it hits happen. Okay. And you need to type the type translation with the I. That's true. Or they are sharing the same kind of information, in which case, that value changing or it can be a factor both factors anyway, and making that inner type def be an inner class. Okay. The other one seems to imply you need a different type of storage class. Um, that's true. So again, this is something you can lead with. And at the beginning, so I started to work on this framework and when I was developing initially, so in the vanilla, let's say, version of it, before I went to the dynamic data structure, um, I did fight with it quite well. So this is something that I used, I employed, actually the, the default way as Aristoskyu is suggesting. So I did, I went through that. It's just in my personal experience, and I think that maybe other people or other developers say the same thing, it became after a while, especially when dealing with multiple actors, so multiple actors that need to share the same configuration data, it became quite cumbersome to actually maintain all these structures, all these type devs. Uh, distributed across across the system. Be that I was using type devs, again, I decided not to use type devs because I didn't want to create coupling between actors, but storing, uh, but by storing um, separate or multiple uh, configuration, multiple type devs in separate libraries and then having to update them if I modify something somewhere. So having, having, keeping them synchronized, that's what I'm trying to say, uh, 
proved to be quite um, quite consuming from the point of view of the effort that I have to, I have to invest. So that's why I wanted to go for a different data structure. I wanted to create this dynamic data structure that I could create at ease and maintain at ease. And that's why I also created the broadcast mechanism because, okay, so I didn't have to anymore define clusters anywhere. I just had to, uh, let's say, describe the structure of my data, let's say, and then the framework would handle the rest. Okay, there is, of course, the overhead that I have to deal with strings. That's true. Um, and yeah, I have to tell you that I had a lot of strings and sometimes I did get lost in a lot of uh, titles and a lot of implementations here and there. Uh, but then again, this is uh, this is something that only time will prove and multiple developers using framework, uh, using this framework and giving me feedback if it's useful or not, or if they want to change it or not, or maybe they want to go for the default way of uh, implementing this data sharing. Uh, yeah, but for me at least in the projects that I used, this tree, this dynamic data structure proved to be quite useful. Plus the API that I built around it for um, publishing and for sharing data between, between the modules. Um, okay, okay, okay. I still the reference in some way. Okay. Okay, so, um, okay, I think this is what I wanted to tell you so far. Anything else, any questions? By the way, I, um, I have to apologize indeed. Uh, when I started the, uh, the presentation, I, uh, I went rather fast to the actual framework and simply because the actual framework in itself are um, quite an universe, are, are an entire universe in, 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 in themselves. So, I simply wouldn't have time to discuss this. Um, I simply presented like general overview of the actor framework, advantages, disadvantages, why I love them, why I hate them. And basically what I wanted to say is that because of the things that I didn't like initially about the actor framework, I decided to build the core framework. And actually the things that made the actor framework great, like the OP based and the inheritance models, this is actually what allowed me to build something like this. And Again, this is something that uh, most likely I'll continue using and I'll continue developing. Um, yeah, again, if the community is interested, I, based on your feedback, again, guys, uh, I can share it and I can um, I, I can share it with you guys so you can check the, the, the source code or you can actually contribute to it, uh, to it as well. Okay, uh, let me see if there is anything else. Okay, so I think these are all the questions so far. Guys, thank you very much for attending. I hope you found it useful. Um, my contact details, I'm gonna post them in Discord as well. You can easily find me on LinkedIn if you want to discuss some stuff. Uh, the session is recorded as well, so you'll be able to access it later on. And yeah, again, have a great evening ahead. Have fun with the other presentations and I cannot wait to, I don't know, continue working and actually learning more about LabVIEW and generally contributing more to the uh, LabVIEW community. Okay, thank you very much, guys.